Hey everybody, Plushy here. So with FGO NA's Christmas event coming to an end, we can finally move on to the actual good farming event of the year, Tunguska Sanctuary. And as a self-proclaimed MFF Services spokesman, I think you deserve a better experience than simply scrolling through the wiki. So even though I usually don't make event guides today, that's exactly what we're going to do. And without further ado, let's get into today's video about Tunguska Sanctuary. And special thanks to FGO Wiki and Atlas Academy Database for all the detailed information. So first of all, let's talk briefly about the banner. The rate up SSR of the event is the AOE permanent quick rider, Taikobo. He is a servant specialized in dealing with demonic enemies, as well as in particular divine enemies, having both a skill that is anti-divine as well as the MP being anti-divine as well. He also has great team utility, being able to charge his teammates with 20 MP charge, as well as buffing their attack up, quick up and MP damage up. So overall, despite being a permanent servant, Taikobo is a really solid unit. And especially if you lack a good AOE rider, I think he is a pretty nice pickup. The four star rate up servant is Dobrinia, and she is also a permanent AOE rider, but instead she is a buster servant specialized in dealing with dragons. And she doesn't just allow herself to do good damage against dragons, she also buffed the entire team with anti-dragon as well. Dobrynia is a pretty mediocre servant. In a vacuum, she actually performs pretty well as an AoE rider. If you are just dealing with casters, she can, you know, perform pretty okay. But she doesn't really bust her loop, which I know a lot of people do care about. And in general, her performance is just okay middle of the ground i would say slightly above average amongst four stars but that really isn't saying much and also because she is permanent you probably will be getting a lot of copies of her in the future however because she's a cute cat girl and she looks like one of those vtubers so people will probably still go for her however the servants are arguably not the biggest reason why a lot of people roll on this banner but the CEs are instead. And it's not even because the CEs themselves are good, but it's because these CEs act as both damage bonus CEs as well as bond bonus CEs during the event specifically. So let's take the five star one, for example. It gives you 8% quick up, 8% buster up, and 8% critical damage up, and it also starts you with 40 MP charge, 50 at MLB. But during the event, it gives you 80% extra damage, 100% at MLB, and 30% extra bond, and 35% at MLB. So lower rarity CEs follow a similar trend as you can see here on screen right now. And honestly, I know a lot of people went into Tunguska expecting to farm a crap ton of bond, looking at all those whales with 10,000 bond per run numbers and drooling over them. However, in my opinion, what you actually get the most out of this event is still just like a normal raid event, QP and a bunch of material. So bond is sort of like a tertiary thing, even with servant coins now being kind of a problem, I still think farming bond is sort of not that important compared to farming materials. And even if you don't want to pull on this banner, you can still pull on the friend point banner to get, at the very least, in my opinion, four MLB copies of the three star CE. So you can backline four of them, pick one support, and also pick an actual good DPS CE for your main DPS. And with that, you can get a maximum of 60% extra bond up without counting your support. So actually, that's not bad at all still. So if you aren't actually interested in any of the raid up servants, I don't feel like you are forced to roll for this banner at all. And even with the damage CE giving you a 40 MP starting charge, technically helps quite a bit for raiding, it's still not as good compared to just a MLB Black Grill, which will usually provide you with a lot more damage, especially because during raids, you will most likely be using Oberon. So there's two things we need to go over before we actually get into the individual raids. The first thing is, of course, the event bonus list. So on top of the two rated up servants having the most event bonus damage, we also got a great lineup of demonic beast trait servants who also have event bonus, which is extremely important because the final raid boss takes super effective damage from all demonic beast trait servants. A couple of notable ones is Ibuki Saber, who gets 50% extra damage on top of being just a great 
Buster Looper, Vitra and Summer Kiara, which are both great arts loopers, especially for this event, and of course Melusine, because Melusine is already extremely strong in most farming events, and in particular for this event, on the final raid boss, she is one of the strongest MVPs. Do note that Kijo Koyo and Summer Kiara in particular needs to be in specific ascension stages to be considered a demonic beast. Kijo Koyo at Ascension 1 and Summer Kiara at Ascension 3. And of course, MASH has the usual party bond up bonus, so if you don't have anyone you particularly want to bond for your final slot, you should slot in MASH to get even more bond on the rest of the four units. When I go through each individual raid boss later, I will be leaving relevant informations on the screen, such as what materials they drop, what traits they have that you can potentially counter, and how many kills that needs to be achieved before each raid ends. However, I won't be going through them verbally every single time to save time. Also, I will be assuming you are doing the highest difficulty for each raid, because they do have significantly better drop rates, except for the fourth and final raid. For the fourth and final raid, the medium difficulty and the highest difficulty actually have almost identical drop rates on every single material, and the only difference is a little bit more QP on the highest difficulty. However, there might be a third reason why you might want to take on the higher difficulty raid boss rather than the medium difficulty raid boss, which we will go through when we actually reach the final raid boss. The first raid boss is Ivan the Terrible, a rider with 950,000 HP. His main raid gimmick is a 80% MP damage resist up that is unremovable that lasts for a single hit. This means that you would have to use another damaging MP to use up this MP damage resist up before your actual main DPS's MP can do normal damage. For buster teams, this is universally runnable by essentially any single target DPS. If you run one Koyan Light with double Oberon, double Oberon's first skill can charge both your main DPS and Koyan Light to 40 MP. You put one of the 50 MP batteries from Oberon to Koyan Light and the other onto your main DPS. Now, both of them would have 90 MP charge already. Now, both of them would be missing 10 charge, but as long as your main DPS has any form of MP battery or either either Koyan Light or your main DPS have a pen to unlocked, they would be at 100 already. And then the other one who is still missing 10 charge, use Koyan Light's 50 battery on them, and then you will be able to MP with Koyan Light's MP into your main DPS's MP and most likely kill the boss. So yeah, any good sort of single target Berserker, Alter Ego, or Assassin can run this boss, so I highly recommend running Buster for this. For Arts and Quick, it's a little bit more complicated because neither Scotty nor Castoria actually have a damaging MP. Uh, for Arts in particular, I do have a suggestion with Ryogi Shiki, or I guess you can also use Assassin Lee, but Ryogi Shiki is free, uh, so she is more accessible. Uh, what you can do is you do double Castoria and Oberon, and you have so much charge with two Castorias and Oberon that you can basically full charge your main DPS's MP as well as Oberon's MP. And of course, what you do next is you do Oberon's MP first to remove the MP damage resist up and then following it up with a invul piercing MP. Once again, most likely from Ryogi Shiki and that would also do decent amount of damage. However, if you don't have Shiki because she is such an old welfare, then you would have to come up with your own solutions. Maybe use another uh, damaging MP servant that can also support either quick or arts for quick, uh, Wu Zetian is someone I can think of, but because Wu Zetian also basically have no starting charge, you might need to run some form of starting charge CE either on her or on your main quick DPS. Um, for both arts and quick though, you can run universal trait buffing DPSs as well. Uh, for example, the one that comes to mind is Dolman. Uh, if you have a chaotic or evil, or most likely a chaotic evil main DPS, then you can use Dolman to remove the first stack of MP damage resist up because he has AD MP battery. He basically doesn't need additional charge uh, with another CE or something to fire off his MP release easily uh, but yeah basically if you can run buster run buster if you're running quick or arts you have to get a little bit more creative the second raid boss is Surter. He is a Saber with also 950,000 HP. His main gimmick is having two hits of Buster Resist Up and two hits of Arts Resist Ups. These are unremovable and they are both 
500%. So it's literally impossible to brute force this. So if you want to use a Buster MP, you'll have to use two other Buster attacks beforehand to do damage. And if you want to use a Arts MP, you have to use two Arts attacks beforehand to do damage. Of course, if you want to use the easiest kind of comp with no card RNG involved at all, Quick is the best card type for this. There are a couple of decent quick single target archers like Bava and Shi, like normal Tristan, like Santa Altera for a free option, or someone like MHXA being a berserker also has anti-saber, so she would also be one of the prime choices for this specific raid. Uh, do note that Surtur has debuff immunity, so Scotty's second skill actually doesn't land, so your damage might not be as crazy as you expect, but still, double Scotty plug over on should be more than enough, especially if you're using Black Grill. If you're using Buster, you can kind of use the Ivan the Terrible comp logic to actually squeeze in a Koyan Light MP. This reduces your normal card RNG. Now you only need one Buster card in your starting hand in order to do damage with your Buster MP. And I specifically brought up Buster because David is a great free to play option. Uh, David with his upgraded MP can actually hit super effectively against giant enemies. And do note that super giant and giant are two different traits, but specifically for Surtur, he is both super giant and a giant. So David is a great free to play option. You just have to sit through an extra MP and also pray you have at least one buster card in your starting hand. As for arts, it's a lot tougher. I would say Arts is probably the worst card type to farm for this particular quest. Um, and obviously there are strong single target Arts options like Kuro being a free one or Chiron being anti-Earth, which does hit super effective against Surtur, but it's very hard to actually come up with two extra Arts attacks before you actually get to do damage. You almost always have to rely on actual real card RNG. What you can do is you can start out with Oberon and plug in Castoria to make your entire deck have the most amount of arts cards possible to reduce RNG. But other than that, I really don't suggest using arts for this. So the third raid of the event is a lot more complicated than usual. It's essentially six tiny raid bosses that is broken down into five different waves and each wave rotates in a set sequence. Um, FGO Wiki has a very good chart for this and I will briefly explain how it works. So as you can see here, essentially when the raid first starts, there will be two raids. There will be Retainer 4 and Retainer 1 from Wave 1 and Wave 2 respectively. And then, for example, if you look down here, Retainer 1 has 400,000 kills uh, total. So after you reach 400,000 kills on the Retainer 1 raid, it will move on to Retainer 5 uh, for Wave 2. And the same thing goes for Retainer 4 on Wave 1. After you've killed all of the Retainer 4s, it goes to Retainer 1 for wave one. And then after you've gone through all five of these rotations, the wave ends completely. And then, you know, you start with wave one and wave two, right? After 20 minutes, wave three will unlock as well. And they work with the same logic. And then after another 20 minutes, wave four will unlock. And after another 20 minutes, wave five will unlock. Ideally, when wave five unlocks, there will be five different raids going on at the same time. And you can pick the one that you want the most. Obviously, if you go really fast, if the server just rush kills the first wave through all of its rotations like super quick then yeah it will end before wave 5 even comes out it really depends on the situation but uh and now i will go into each individual raid boss and talk about their gimmicks Retainer 1 are basically the Yagas from Lost Belt 1. The main Yaga has 297,000 HP and is a Saber. And the other two smaller Yagas are Berserkers that have 97,000 HP and 87,000 HP respectively. Their main gimmick is having two hits of evades on all of them. So if you have an AoE Archer with Invol Pierce or Short Hit, they're all great options. And also, this gimmick gives all Wild Beast Trade Servants sure hit automatically. Now do note that Wild Beast Trade Servants are not Demonic Beast Trade Servants, so they don't really all overlap, but there are some 
of them that overlap. For example, Tomacat is one that has event damage bonus as well as qualify, so you can use Double Scotty Tomacat, which is also a great option. Dobrynia is also a Wild Beast Servant, so you can use double like a Buster Comp with Dobrynia if you have her at high enough MP. Even though it's neutral damage, she does have event bonus damage by 100% as well. Uh, so yeah, really depends on your comp. This is not very hard. Retainer 3 is basically the Tiger Tank from Lost Belt 3. Uh, it's a singular Archer enemy with 585,000 HP. And its main gimmick is you can't use Plug Suit. And also, it skill seals your entire team. Uh, and the best way to deal with this, in my opinion, is having Atlas Mystic Code to cleanse one of your supports that can cleanse the other two team members. So Santa Nightingale is one of the best options, in my opinion. She can give the main DPS a lot of good buffs, and her first skill can cleanse both the other supports. So you can run someone something like Oberon, Santa Nightingale, and a single target Buster, Berserker, or Lancer, and it can pretty much easily take care of this boss. Uh, do note that with Santa Nightingale and Oberon, you will only have 70 charge, and even with maxed out append twos, you will only have 90 charge. So you will still need some form of battery uh, on your main DPS because remember, for the Mystic Code, you are kind of forced to run Atlas as well. If that is the case, you can also alternatively run Asclepius. Asclepius also cleanses your other two team members and can also give them 20 additional MP charge. So now for your main DPS, if you have a Pen 2 unlocked with Oberon, you can have 100 MP charge already. So with Asclepius, you are obviously losing out some form of damage buff from Nightingale, but if you really want to run Black Grill with Oberon, then this might be another option. Retainer 4 are basically three Kali's from Lost Belt 4. The biggest one is a Berserker with 297,000 HP, and the smaller ones are also Berserkers with 91,000 HP and 95,000 HPs respectively. And their main gimmick is cast Casting a unremovable 50% attack down on all your allies. But because they're all Berserkers, it's super easy. You just brute force through them with your strongest AoE. There's not much to say about this one. Retainer 5 is a singular Rider Cerberus from Lost Belt 5. It has 700,000 HP, and its main gimmick actually is no gimmick. Uh, if you're aiming for one turn kills, its gimmick basically doesn't trigger at round start. So it's just a 700,000 HP rider beat stick. So any strong single target berserker, assassin, or alter ego should be able to take this out super easily. LWB M8 are assassin enemies, and for the raid, three of them appear. The biggest one have 400,000 HP, and the smaller ones have 116,000 HP and 110,000 HP respectively. Their main gimmick is reviving with 10,000 HP guts after they die for the first time. The easiest way to deal with this is having a strong main DPS MP, and then following it up with a weaker MP to take out the guts. One of the actual great options for taking out the guts is Oberon. Despite Oberon's class where he does half damage to uh, cavalry classes, 10,000 HP is such a low number that if you just have some form of AoE buff, Oberon should be able to do enough damage to kill all of them, even at MP1. This also makes Dolman a great choice as a main DPS because Dolman can buff Oberon's damage a bunch. Alternatively, you can also try to use something like double Dolman to get enough curse damage to kill the guts. However, this will mean that usually, unless your Dolman is super stacked, you will need a third uh, single target MP DPS to kill the big one. And then that means you will have to sit through three separate MPs, which is kind of annoying. But this one is a little bit more rough than the previous two, but once again, just do big AoE MP into Oberon MP, you should be fine. And finally, HWB M8 is a singular ruler boss with 600,000 HP. Its main gimmick is having a unremovable 30% defense up. So other than using a defense ignore MP, all you can do is brute force this just like the Kali one. Uh, Kintoki actually has a defense ignore MP and he's also a berserker. So he's the best 
person to deal with this. But even if you don't have Kintoki, you don't really have to worry. Just brute force this with any strong Berserker. Like you can even use a free option like um, Jolter Summer. For example, you just do double Oberon plug Koyan Light uh, with plug suit. I can't really imagine this not working out, to be honest. Like, there's just so many ways to bolster your damage. A 600,000 HP boss with 30% defense up should be a piece of cake with how much amount of burst damage we have nowadays. And of course, the final raid boss of the event is Koyam Beast herself, and she is a beast class enemy with a whopping 1.7 million HP. Uh, and her class advantage is that she does double damage to Hominidae servants, and she takes double damage from demonic beast trade servants. So that is why I mentioned all of the demonic beast trade servants that have event bonuses earlier on because they will be the best counters for this particular raid boss and of course she also does have damage to all casters in particular but other than casters no other class interacts with this beast and instead traits are what determines what kind of damage she deals and she takes but on top of Koyam Beast herself, she also summons up to six different retainers. The six retainers are going to be three casters that are Moors and three Lancers that are Jotuns, one on each side. And their HP increases with each set that gets defeated and the next set comes up, their HP gradually increases. So the first set would have their HP at about 140,000 and the last set would have their HP at about 180,000. So it might be a little bit tough for normal AoE servants to deal with them in one single AoE MP. And more importantly, these trash mobs or retainers actually drop unique materials that are different from what the main Koyan body drops. So I know a lot of people came into this event hoping to farm a bunch of bells from Lost Belt 6, but the bells from Lost Belt 6 actually only drops from the Moors trash mob and not the actual Koyan body. So the most efficient way to farm this is to three turn this raid node and killing all six different retainers along alongside with the main Koyan body on the final turn, instead of trying to one turn this with maximum damage immediately. There are two main gimmicks that can potentially impede your raid farming on this raid node. The first one is every single retainer will give Koyan Beast 50,000 HP when they die. So you can potentially be dealing with 300 extra thousand HP on the main boss body because you will be killing six of the retainers ideally. So all of them will be giving Koyan Beast 50,000 for each death. The second annoying gimmick is that Koyan Beast has a chance to cast AoE Terror on all of your teammates. And Terror is obviously very annoying. If the Terror triggers on the third turn, for example, stunning your entire team, the whole run might be dead. However, it's very easy to avoid this because Koyan Beast cannot cast this Terror round start and you just simply stun her with a plug suit on the first turn. So she can't move on the second turn either. And of course she can't cast Terror on the second turn either. And finally on the third turn, which is the ideal turn when you will kill her off even if she casts terror you still get to move at the very least for another turn so you can just kill her off even if the terror trigger on the next turn it doesn't matter you already won as I briefly mentioned before when talking about the event bonus servants, there are four servants that are super good at dealing with this last raid, and if you have any of them, you are absolutely in luck. The first one is Saber Ibuki, and unlike normally, she can actually run Black Grail because she gets hit by Koyambi, so she gets more refund. She can also use her face cards, and she gets more refund. Uh, Saber Ibuki has the highest uh, event bonus damage out of these four, so it also helps her damage even more. And also, Saber Ibuki Buki can take advantage of the Buster Down that normally she cannot because the Buster Down stays on Koyan Beast and it helps both her MP damage and face card damage after her initial MP. Do be careful though if your Saber Ibuki uh, is a little bit too beefy, like for example if you 120'd her, you might want to be a little bit more gentle on Koyam Beast because uh, you might accidentally prematurely kill her before you actually uh, kill all of the trash mobs and get all of the drops. 
Same thing kind of goes for Melusine, but Melusine doesn't even need any card RNG because she already can loop with Black Girl normally, so you don't actually have to force select her cards, even though I still suggest doing that if your Melusine isn't like particularly beefy, because you still want to make up for the card damage and killing the middle boss, because she does still have a lot of HP, like effectively 2 million HP. Melusine can even start in Ascension 3 if you want to have extra MP damage, because now you get to use her MP damage buff on her third skill twice instead of just once. However, if you are running third Ascension Melusine, you will be forced to select face cards just like Ibuki to make up for the missing charge. In the arts card section, Vitra, in my opinion, is actually one of the strongest DPSs to farm this raid, because Vitra is not just a demonic beast servant, she also is anti-divine, and of course Koyam Beast is a divine enemy, so she kind of has anti-trait on top of the class advantage. Vitra also is able to skill seal all enemies whenever she MPs. This helps with two things. First of all, it prevents Koyam Beast from actually using that devastating terror skill we mentioned a little bit earlier, so you don't actually have to bring a plug suit to stun her. And secondly, of course, you allow Koyam Beast to attack more times instead of wasting action on skills, so you get even more defensive MP gain. If you have a exceptionally beefy Vitra, you can even run just frontline only with double Castoria because you don't actually have to use the stun, and also you get so much refund as an art servant that you absolutely do not need the extra 70 MP charge. So it really depends on your setup. If you have a really strong Vitra, you don't have to run Oberon. Similar thing can be said about Summer Kiara. It's not because she can use Skill Seal, but because Castoria can remove the terror if things go wrong. So that kind of goes for all art servants, to be honest. With Summer Kiara, there are two things to be careful. Uh, first of all, remember to put her in third ascension. That's when she actually is counted as a demonic beast. Uh, and secondly, I think it's better to use her third skill immediately for the extra refund and damage on Koyam Beast herself, instead of trying to save it and get the absolute maximum amount of damage on the third turn. So these four are obviously the big four, the best ones to deal with this raid, especially for three turn farming, but there are a lot of other solutions. If you have any super strong 120 AoEs, they might be able to do this as well because it's not like Koyam Beast takes half from them, they just take double damage from Koyam Beast and at 120, they probably won't die within 3 turns anyways. Uh, another particularly great unit is Mao Nobu. I want to bring up Mao Nobu briefly because she does great damage against divine enemies. However, if your Mao Nobu is not grailed, you kind of have to be a little bit more careful because she is one of those servants that are very flimsy and also Buster supports don't really provide any extra survival, so she does have a chance to die on the second wave before she even reaches the third wave. Uh, the one saving grace for Buster is that Koyan Light is surprisingly a great DPS because don't forget she's also a demonic beast trade servant. So Koyan Light can actually finish off the job even if your main DPS somehow screws up in a Buster comp. So that's not too bad, but still you will be wasting like three to four turns or even longer if you screw up your normal three turn looping comp. You might remember me saying uh, that the medium difficulty of this raid essentially have identical drops to the highest difficulty, and you might ask me then why would I ever go for the highest difficulty? Well, one reason is actually to prevent you killing the middle boss prematurely, as I mentioned before. So the HP of Koyam Beast goes down from 1.7 million to 1.2 million, and if your main DPS is too strong, she might not be able to tank 2 MPs. So Going for the higher difficulty is actually a preventive measure to prevent your DPS from killing Koyam Beast way too easily. So I definitely recommend testing out both nodes when this first come out and then you decide on which one you are more comfortable with and then go for that one instead of forcing yourself onto either difficulty. 
And of course, I am only giving you the most quote unquote meta recommendations with the best AP to material drop ratio. If you only care about bond, you can still go for one turn kill comps and it's very easy to set up as well. You can just use a normal AOE, pair up with a strong single target to nuke the boss. And it's absolutely not difficult to do, especially in the medium difficulty. You don't even have to bring a demonic beast single target. You can bring someone with anti-divine like Skahak she'll probably still nuke Koi and Beast pretty hard. Originally, I was going to include a boss guide section in this video as well, but seeing how long this video has been going on, I will cut it extremely short right now. So first of all, when you fight every single boss, I recommend bringing Mash, because whenever you activate Mash's first skill during the event, Habitrot will be summoned and act as an extra damage hit before you actually start your damage chain. And Habitrot will not just use her MP, but also she will cast a 4 turn attack down and damage taken increase on the enemy so basically it softens off the enemy boss a lot and that will basically make every single boss in this event a joke minus the final boss the final boss has a bunch of very annoying gimmicks but there is one way to basically ignore 90 percent of all of it and still beat it with relative ease which is using tamamo caster to solo i have a video on it but i will give you the shortest rundown ever and tell you the kill sequence of each enemy when you solo with Tamamo Caster. So on the first break bar, ignore the two other enemies and focus fire on Koyanskaya. On the second break bar, do the exact same thing, ignore the other two enemies and only attack Koyanskaya. On the third break bar, attack the Berserker Kali enemy first and kill it, and then finally go back to attacking Koyanskaya and ignore the Moors enemy. And on the final bar, kill the ruler enemy before anything else. Most important part about this entire fight and then kill the tiger tank to prevent him from removing your buffs. And finally, you should be able to finish off Koyanskaya with relative ease. Anyways, that's the end of the video. I apologize for rushing on the final part, but I think the video is long enough in itself. I hope you guys enjoyed. I spent a lot of time on this and let me know what I can improve on making another event guide in the future because this is my first time doing something like this. And of course, I wish this at least was a little bit helpful and I hope you all enjoy Tunguska when it eventually comes to NA.